I'm David Marsland. There are more than 30,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus around the world, but the number could be much higher. Right now, as the death toll rises towards 700, there's a global race to produce a vaccine. Today's podcast is about that effort. From the Evening Standard in London, this is The Leader. In the search for the source of coronavirus, scientists are looking at the forests of China. In amongst the trees, somewhere in the wildlife, this is where it's currently believed the disease started. Because, as infectious disease expert Professor David Heyman explains, this is how they all start. This outbreak um, is important for two reasons. It spread rapidly during the Chinese New Year, but also it boarded airplanes and, and spread out into other countries. So every outbreak has dynamics, but every human infection that we have, endemic, likely has come from some place in nature in the past, whether it's tuberculosis or HIV. The transfer from animal to human is thought to have happened via one of the food markets in China's city of Wuhan. The stalls there are stacked with cages containing exotic animals, some captured from the forests, some of them protected species. Evening Standard Health Editor Ross Lydell says among them is likely to be the carrier of the coronavirus. Initially it was reported that it was potentially from bats or snakes. Or certainly we know that there are more than one life animal market in Wuhan and around that was suspected to be the source of this. Today there were reports in a Chinese university that essentially a type of anteater, I believe, uh, is now potentially thought to be the source. Essentially this seems to be the case that some of these species, even though they're endangered, were still being traded and eaten in China. But knowing where it came from is less important than knowing how to stop it. Because we have a common enemy, which is dangerous, and which can bring a serious upheaval, social, political, economic. This is time to fight it and in unison. The World Health Organization's Director General, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, told a conference in Geneva that the world has to take on coronavirus. No one country or organization can stop this outbreak alone. Our best hope and our only hope is to work together. Good morning. Um, I'm here to talk about our efforts in terms of developing a vaccine against this virus. Professor Robin Shattuck from Imperial College London is one of hundreds of scientists from all over the world committed to finding a vaccine. He spoke at a briefing in London. One of the good news stories about uh, the epidemic is that Chinese scientists were able to make the sequence of the virus available online to researchers around the world very quickly. And that's allowed our, ourselves, as well as other groups, to identify the part of the virus that encodes for the surface protein on the virus that would be the main target for protective antibodies. His team's breaking down the virus's code to find a weakness. They could start some trials next week, but it'll be months before it's ready for human testing. Over in Oxford, Professor Sarah Gilbert is coming at the problem with different technology, but she told journalists that everyone working on a vaccine faces the same issues in delivering it. We can start measuring immune responses from the first people that we immunise. Do we get antibodies that recognise the spike protein? Can they neutralise the virus? But we need to know about efficacy. And in 2014, in the Ebola outbreak, it was the vaccine efficacy studies that took time to decide on how the studies would be designed, what would be ethical. Um, and how you could best work out if the vaccine actually worked. Now, we're in a different situation here. The mortality rate is very much lower. That means that the efficacy trials will probably not be the same design. We'll have something different. But there needs to be agreement as to how we're going to determine which vaccines are effective because we don't want to be rolling out vaccines for use in large numbers without knowing if they actually work. The scientists in the labs, though, do have one unusual advantage in their studies a completely isolated group of thousands of people who coronavirus is trying to get. Masks are uh, being delivered uh, as uh, we speak. Quarantine requirements are that uh, 
you wear a mask when going out of your cabins and to avoid congregating in big groups and to keep a safe distance of one meter when talking uh, uh, with uh, another guest. So the Diamond Princess is one of these huge great cruise ships that um, is at any one point sailing around the world, taking thousands and thousands of passengers to uh, various ports and destinations. On this occasion, they were caught up in, in the coronavirus storm. The Evening Standards' Jonathan Prince says, including passengers and crew, there are 3,700 people on the Diamond Princess. It tends to be full of people of a, of a certain vintage, often celebrating anniversaries and, and, and key events and so on. They're supposed to be on the holiday of a lifetime, travelling through Asia on an enormous ship with balcony restaurants, swimming pools, live entertainment and an adults-only roof bar. Now they're stuck on the boat, stranded off Japan, quarantined from the outside world. They're not allowed to get too close to each other, not even for warmth. It's 39 degrees and it's pretty cold, so they don't want anyone gathering in groups. It's freezing. But I'll tell you what, it feels good me being in that room. Every morning, the captain comes on the tannoy to remind them... Quarantine officials are monitoring this process. So it's turned into a kind of floating prison, effectively, for... 2,600 passengers, 3,700 souls on board in total, including staff, and very restricted in what they can do. On day two of a scheduled 14-day quarantine, the ship unlocked extra TV channels for the passengers and upgraded the broadband, allowing people like David Abel to live stream their ordeal and explain to families back home that the risk is very real. Things are happening... um Literally every hour something is changing, the biggest of course being 41 additional passengers uh, being found positive, tested for the coronavirus, one of whom is a friend of ours on honeymoon who has been, um, who was going to be split from his wife, you know, on honeymoon. He is going to be taken to a medical facility and she will have to remain on board. That is going to be very, very, very tough indeed. Mr Abel claims that man, who is from the UK, showed no symptoms. But passengers have to take their own temperatures at regular intervals using thermometers provided in their cabins. If yours is high, you've got it and you're taken off the ship. So far, that's 42 out of 3,700. And that's fascinating for scientists like David Heyman. They're the cruise ships, which also provide a good idea of how transmissible this is. So all this information is feeding into WHO risk assessments and also the data is used as a, an exercise for modeling to help, I, to help understand what might happen in the future. From land to sea, the coronavirus has spread at a rate that's alarmed those who have studied similar outbreaks like SARS. It's not stopping, but it may be slowing. Although, as Ross Lydell explains, the figures may not be accurate. It exploded amongst the population so quickly and also the fact that it was contracted by the healthcare workers, so they were then spreading it to other patients without knowing. It's now the sense that the spread of the virus is at such an extent that they're just struggling to cope in sort of human terms in the sense that they don't have the manpower able to both look after these patients and then record how many cases they're dealing with. Even so, it's possible the virus will burn itself out by the summer before any vaccine is ready. But this may not be the last time we see this strain. It may not even be the first. Sometimes they just cause an outbreak and disappear and other times they continue on spreading in humans like influenza does and they can be then permanent residents or temporary residents in, in humans for many, many different seasons of influenza. So these viruses come periodically and, and it wouldn't be um, too much exaggerated to say that there may have been coronavirus outbreaks in the past in humans in various parts of the world that never became, um, came to the attention of the scientific community because they were small um, and they were not put together. The race to find a vaccine goes on.